As we talk today, one of the things that comes to mind from our text and, and trying to understand it a little bit better is the, the Civil War, the American Civil War that happened, boy, what, a century and a half ago, somewhere in that time frame, two centuries ago almost now at this point. Uh, and when we think about that conflict, there are some main players that, that come to mind in this. You know, we might think of someone like Abraham Lincoln, who was the president of the Union, or, or Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederacy. You know, we might also think of people like uh, Ulysses S. Grant, who was the uh, Union general at the time, or, or even Robert E. Lee, who was the, the general of the Confederate forces. We might even think of names like Stonewall Jackson, who was a general for the Confederacy, or even uh, Ambrose Burnside, who, by the way, is the reason we have the name Side Burns. Okay, you can actually Google that. If you look at his picture online, you'll see why. Legit, he is the reason why we have the phrase Side Burns. But he was also a Union general at the time during the Civil War, too. And so those are some of the names that, that might come to mind for you when you think about the American Civil War. But I got to know, in, in talking through that just briefly, did anybody have in mind Private Shadrach or Private Wilson? Anybody know those names at all? Anybody know of them? Yeah, and I wouldn't expect that we would. You see, Private Shadrach and Private Wilson were part of a raiding party in the early parts of the Civil War on the Union side. Uh, their mission was essentially to go down to Georgia, commandeer a locomotive, uh, go to Chattanooga with it, and basically perform acts of sabotage along the way, destroying railroad lines, uh, communication lines, bridges, whatever it might be that would help the Confederate forces reinforce Chattanooga because the Union wanted to take that city. It would have been a huge blow to the Confederacy if the Union was able to capture it. And so Private Shadrach and Private Wilson, along with 20 others, decided to go on this raid, and they were successful. They were able to take the locomotive. They were able to perform those acts of sabotage as they long, went along the way. But they ran into some problems about 18 miles outside of Chattanooga. You see, the locomotive ran out of steam. And it was at that point where they were given the order to basically abandon the locomotive and to evade capture. But unfortunately for all the 22 men who were on this raid, every single one of them was captured, and even eight of them put to death, including Private Shadrach and Private Wilson. But you know, because of their efforts, the Union Army was actually able to encircle Chattanooga and eventually take the city, which, which dealt a major blow to the Confederacy. And these two guys who we really don't know about, knew nothing about, maybe up until this moment, had a major role to play in that. Which just goes to show, even if your name isn't known, it doesn't change the impact you have in a situation. You know, we may not know Private Shadrach and Private Wilson, but it didn't change their impact on the war or even in the people in the lives around them. And that's not just true for Private Shadrach and, and Private Wilson. It's also true for what we see in our gospel text for today from Luke chapter 18 and 19, where we hear the story of Zacchaeus. How many of you know the story of Zacchaeus? Yeah, good number of you do, right? It's part of children's ministry lore. It's, it's a story we hear every year, and along with that, it's got a catchy song, right? Zacchaeus was a wee... I'm going to be the only one singing. Okay, that sounds good. I'll carry it. There you go. Hey, there you go. Thank you. Retreat. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. I'm not going to stop you. In the tree. I'm going to your house today. Or I'm going to your house today. See? There it is. Look at that, huh? Absolutely. We know Zacchaeus. We know his song, right? It's a great place to be. But also with Zacchaeus comes a great story, right? What we're told in the text, Jesus walks into Jericho, this large crowd is gathered around him, and Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, and so he can. He can't see him, as the song says, he's a wee little man. And so he has to climb up into a sycamore tree to try to see Jesus for himself. And at that point, Jesus sees him, invites Zacchaeus over to his home, or over to uh, Zacchaeus' house, invites himself over to that house, and Zacchaeus repents and begins to follow Jesus. 
It's a great story. And it's one that we actually know pretty well. But have you ever thought about the reason why it was Zacchaeus had to go up in that tree? I know we talked in the text already about how there was this large crowd that had gathered, so Zacchaeus had to get up there to do it. But have you ever thought about why there was such a large crowd at that point? Well, all you have to do is just go back a couple of quick verses in Luke chapter 18, where we're told of this blind beggar who heard about Jesus, who had this this crowd kind of pass on by, and he cries out to Jesus for help. And Jesus stops, and he heals the man, restoring his sight. And at that point, this is what we get in the text. Look to the screen. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. And so if you want to know why there's such a large crowd in Luke chapter 19, it's right there. Because this blind man received his sight and then went about the work of making the name of Jesus known. And without this man, Zacchaeus may not be even in that tree. And here's the thing. We don't know his name. There's no name given for this blind beggar. We don't know if it's Jim, we don't know if it's Jeff, we don't know if it's Ross, we don't know his name whatsoever. And yet even without knowing his name, it doesn't change the impact he has on the people around him, the impact that he has in Zacchaeus' life. And you know, that's not just true for the blind beggar or even Zacchaeus. It's true for all of us as well. Let me ask you this. How many of you know the name Al Shank? Anybody know Al Shank? Anybody? Anybody? No? It's okay, I wouldn't expect that. You see, Al lived in Baden, Missouri, which is an inner ring urban area of St. Louis. Al was a divorced man uh, who had adult children by the time I got to know him. Uh, He loved movies, loved Netflix at the time when you got the DVDs in the mail, right? Just loved that element of it. He also loved solving mysteries, Like he actively was part of some Jack the Ripper group trying to to solve that case, trying to to see if there were things missed, right? He just loved those things. But he was also pastor at Ebenezer Lutheran Church in Baden, Missouri, at the church that I served during my seminary years. And, And this man had an enormous impact in my life. I mean, yeah, he taught me how to preach and he, and he taught me how to write sermons and Bible studies and lead worship and all of those things, all of those elements, but the biggest impact he had was just simply helping me understand better how important that relationship with Jesus is in my life, how, how impactful that relationship is every day in my life. And yet, even with that kind of impact, none of you knew who he was. And that's okay. I I didn't expect you to know who he was. But even though you don't know his name, it doesn't change the impact he has on my story. And so I got to know here this morning, do you have someone like that in your life? Someone who's walked with you, who's, who's made an impact in your life, not just in a positive way, but in a way that helps you better understand who Jesus is, the the importance of that relationship that God has made with you. Do you have that person in your life? Even that person who, if you said their name in a group of people, people would be like, I I don't know who that is, right? Who are you talking about, right? Do you have someone like that? And it's true, isn't it? Even though you could say their name in a group of people like this and no one may know who it is, it doesn't change their impact. It doesn't change how they've made changes in your life following Jesus. And I know I keep coming back to that truth over and over and over again in this sermon, but it's such an important truth, especially in our world, especially in our lives, because we're told constantly that we need to make a name for ourselves that we need to go into this world and and make a name for ourselves. And the only way we can actually make an impact in this world is if we make a name for ourselves. That if we're not known, that if we're not widely known by a bunch of people in a bunch of different places, our impact is non-existent. And you see that in social media. 
You see that even at work, right? Am I the best employee? I want to be the best employee. I want to be known as the best employee. You even see that in parenting. I want to be known as the best parent, right? Even in churches, we want to be the best church. We see that desire to, to make our name known rather than the name of Jesus. And you know, that sinful desire leads to such dangerous places. It leads to comparison. And from that comparison, it leads to finding our value there. Again, think about it. Am I the best employee or am I the worst employee? Am I the the best parent or am I the worst parent? Am I the, 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 the best person in the world making the most impact? Or am I the worst person in the world not making any impact or at least seemingly like I'm not making any impact at all? And then what does that say about who I am? If I'm feeling like the worst employee at the moment, what does that say about my value? If I'm feeling like the the worst parent in that moment, what does that say about my value? If I feel like I'm the, the worst this or that in my life, what does that say about my value? What does the world say about my value? And I gotta tell you what the world will tell you is that you're worthless. That because you haven't made a name for yourself, because your name is not known out there in so many great ways, that you have no worth, that you have no value. But the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ is no matter who you are, no matter if your name is known across the globe or not even known in any way whatsoever, you are priceless to him. You are valuable to him. Whether you're feeling like the best employee or the worst employee, whether you're feeling like the best parent or the worst parent, whether you're feeling like you're, you're making the greatest impact or you feel like you're not making any impact at all, it doesn't change how Jesus sees you. It, it doesn't change the value that he has for you, that you are valued, that you are precious, that you are priceless to him. And that's one of the great truths in our text for today from Luke 18 and 19, two very different people in two very different sets of circumstances But at the very least, we know of one name and we have no idea what the other is and yet it does not matter. It doesn't matter to Jesus because they are both valuable to him, worthy of his time, worthy of his grace, his compassion, his mercy. For the blind beggar, what does he do? He heals his sight. For Zacchaeus, what does he do? He heals his soul. It doesn't matter if they know their names or not. It doesn't matter if their names are recorded in the annals of history. They matter to Jesus. And most importantly, their names are known by him as he comes into their lives, showing them how precious, how priceless they are to him always. And you are too. No matter if your name is known across the globe or if your name is forgotten in the pages of history, you are valuable to him. You are priceless. You are precious to him always. And you talk about impact. There is no greater impact than knowing where our value is found. That's what we saw in our gospel text. After Jesus heals the blind beggar, look to the screen, what do we see? It says, and immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. And even with Zacchaeus, look to the screen. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. For them, after being shown that they are valuable to Christ, what happens? What do they do? They go out into the world making his name known. Not talking about themselves. Not showing themselves to others about how great they are or how much their name should be known across the world. They're only interested in making one name known. 
And that's the name of Jesus Christ, their Savior and their Lord. And you want to talk about uncomfortable. It's right there. Because it's already uncomfortable enough to just make Jesus' name known in this world. But to make his name known above everything else, above even our own name, that's uncomfortable. And the challenge we have today and this week is will we do it? Can we do it? Can we be okay if our name is lost to the pages of history, but the name of Jesus Christ continues for generation after generation after generation? Can we be okay if no one remembers who we are, but they remember the name that is above every other name? Can we be okay if we are forgotten, but the only name that saves continues on for generation after generation after generation? Can we be okay if Christ's name is lifted up above our own, not just today, but every day that is to come? My hope and prayer is that we can be okay with that. That we can be okay lifting up his name even above our own because you want to talk about impact? It's right there. Because I got to tell you, if it's just about me making my name known, my name won't save you. My name won't save you and yours won't either but Jesus name does it can and it will and so may God give us the courage and the boldness to continue going into our lives making his name known the only name that matters the only name that can save today and always. Amen? Amen. Amen.